Now, let's look into the deeper meaning of Dasadama Sutta. Dasadama Sutta is probably the most frequently chanted of all the suttas, and that's because it's an integral part of the daily chanting for purita or protection. Because of this, it's very familiar, and the topics that it raises are applicable to everyone who is trying to lead a holy life, sacred life. So the sutta opens, Evang me suttang. Every sutta starts like that. Well, what does that mean? It means that I have heard this knowledge. This knowledge does not originate with me. I am not speculating anything. I have heard it. It has come down to me. Sutang. Sutang originally means thread, but in this context it refers to the succession of teachers and students going all the way back to the Buddha. So, I have heard this knowledge by disciplic succession, not in the ordinary way, not on the street, certainly, and not in casual conversation, but in the process of learning from a teacher who, if one is fortunate, is a realized being. So, on one occasion, the date isn't given, but it was during the pastimes of the Buddha 
2,600 years ago. The next verse. The Buddha often stayed at Savati. Savati was one of his favorite places, especially because of the wonderful monastery donated by Anatta Pindika. Anatta Pindika was extremely wealthy, and there was a certain park that the Buddha was very fond of there. He would go there with his disciples and teach. Anatta Pindika wanted to build something, some facilities, to make his stay more comfortable. However, the park there was owned by another person, and he made an offer. I will cover the ground. I will give you as much money as would cover the ground. We don't know exactly how big it was. It was probably, you know, several acres in size. It's a lot of money. And the owner declined the offer. The matter went for adjudication, and the council decreed that actually this is a fair offer, more than fair. And so uh, Anatta Pindaka was able to buy the, the land and build the monastery for the Buddha. So his unparalleled generosity is well known in Buddhist circles. The next verse, the Buddha would often, almost daily, call his disciples together. Now these aren't ordinary disciples. Uh, not only are they monks, most of them were arhats. So his assembly was extremely wonderful. That's why we chose this particular picture. They were like him in quality. They were gone. Gate, gate, paragate. They were gone beyond all conceptions of views and self and being. So uh, these were an extraordinary audience. And when they sat, they would sit perfectly silently for hours and listen to the Buddha's discourses. So the Buddha gave many, many discourses in the presence of this very exalted group. So he addressed them as uh, bhikkhu. Bhikkhu is a monk who has gone out of the family circle, has gone out of the home, and now he is living as a mendicant, a wanderer, a beggar. When the Buddha addresses them as bhikkhu, this is something very special, very respectful. Uh, in the next verse, he calls them badante, bante, uh, in the plural, badante. Bante is a title that means like reverend, venerable. Any monk who is properly situated is venerable. But these monks were really special because they were the personal associates of the Buddha. So they responded, Bhagavan! You can imagine the whole, whole group responding in unison must have been a, a very wonderful sound. These four verses, these first four slides, actually don't appear in the original source material. They are interpolated because the original Dasadama Sutta is one out of a whole series of suttas that are presented one after the other without any introductory text. The introductory text appears at the beginning of the section, but there are maybe 20 or 30 suttas in that section. So it doesn't appear exactly the way it's presented here in the Paritta chanting. It's put there in order to give a context for the sutta itself. This is very important because context determines meaning. The meaning of any particular word is determined by the context in which it appears the words around it, and especially preceding it. So these four verses are given to set the time and place, the situation, context for the words that follow. Especially important is the fact that the Buddha was not just talking to anybody. He wasn't addressing a general audience. He was addressing his personal followers, the bhikkhus. Now we get to the part that the Buddha said. There are ten truths that a person controlling his senses, and the word here is pabbajitena. Pabbajitena literally means one who has conquered the senses. The Buddha is not only talking to ordinary monks, he's talking to monks who have conquered their senses, whose senses are completely under their control. He's telling them that there are 10 things, 10 topics or subjects, that such a person should contemplate a binham, often, repeatedly. Pachavekitabha. Pachavekitabha means looking upon, considering, 
reviewing, realizing, or contemplating. And this is reflection. And uh, in another video, we talked about reflective consciousness. The difference between reflective and reflexion. Reflection is considering the past and future and its meaning and its relation to our process of self-realization. Whereas reflexion with an X means the analysis of the experience in the present moment. That's meditation. So the Buddha is not telling the monks to meditate on these 10 things. He's telling them to reflect upon these 10 things and see how their activities in the past and their intentions for the future are shaping up in view of their commitment to having gone forth as a bhikkhu. In the next verse, he begins to say, which 10? And each of the 10 topics ends with the word iti. Iti is usually translated thus, but it can also act as an affirmative particle and can mean certainly. However, in this context, it refers to that which has been said before. In other words, the Buddha is referring back to the introduction, back to the context. And what is the context? He is addressing the bhikkhus. He's not just discussing these topics in a general sense, but specifically for those who have gone forth as monks, bhikkhus. Therefore, I interpolated by going forth at the beginning of each of the ten topics, because that is the sense referred to by iti. To translate it as thus would not really give the full meaning in this context. By going forth, I have become casteless. Now in the West, caste is determined by economic calculations or political calculations. But in the East, caste is traditionally determined by birth. Your family, your birth, determines your position in society, your prospects, your possibilities, and basically your whole life. But by going forth, one becomes casteless. This was a revolutionary idea introduced by the Buddha, that you're no more determined by your birth, by your body, or by your family, background, or past. But you have become a person of pure consciousness, not any more conditioned by the body. This is a very important, very deep idea in the Buddha's teaching, a revolutionary concept at the time, attracted a lot of opposition from the caste system, especially the Brahmins and the kings, who obviously benefited the most from it. This is why Buddhism was driven out of India after the Buddha's time. After Emperor Asoka, there was a tremendous backlash against Buddhism from the Brahmanism and the caste-conscious Hindus violently kicked Buddhism out of India. And uh, so the center of Buddhism went to Sri Lanka, where the Buddha's teachings were compiled into the suttas, which are the earliest records derived from the oral tradition. It also went east to Burma, China, Southeast Asia, and north to Tibet. And those became different traditions with their own scriptures, which were written by other people later because of the need to translate the Buddha's teaching into other languages and other societies. But the suttas, the Theravada suttas, are the earliest writings known to descend directly from the Buddha's words. Now the next one. By going forth, my life is dependent on others. A bhikkhu is a beggar. He is not a free agent in the sense that he has to offer some value to the community around him. He has to give teachings. He has to give advice. His mere presence is there to encourage people to act in a moral way, in a way that brings them out of the morass of conditioned consciousness. The bhikkhu is actually in an exchange with the society. He's not separate from the society. He's dependent on others for his food, his lodging, and clothing, and so on. The next verse, By going forth, my behavior should be different from householders and others, is implied. It should be different from householders because the aim of being a monk is not enjoyment, not sense pleasure, not economic development or political development. It should be centered on the effort to attain self-realization, to attain enlightenment. 
and it should be different from other renunciants who follow a different path. So in other words, the Buddha had his own way of life. In fact, there are so many things that the Buddha taught in the Vinaya, ways of life for his monks that have been passed down even to the present day. So these precepts, 227 by formal count, but by actual practice, there are many more, are the way of life that the Buddha's monks and lay followers practice even to the present day. It's a unique social system that encourages the monks in their progress. So in the next verse, by going forth, will I on self-examination find fault with my morality or virtue? By making a commitment to be a monk, you're taking up these moral precepts very seriously. It should be a matter of regular self-examination to see if one is really following them. Uh, There are many people who would like to have the social status of a monk, but who don't really follow the uh, strict morality that's prescribed for a monk. A monk should do no harm. A monk should cause no pain to anyone. And if he does, he has to correct himself and he has to make up the damage because he's made a commitment, he's made a promise, and now he's obligated. The next verse is similar. By going forth, will my fellow monks on close examination find fault with my morality or virtue? So it's not just a matter of what I think of myself. It's also a matter of what the monks, especially the senior monks, see in my practice. Now, it's a fact that we live in an age of decline. Each generation of disciples, each generation of monks, is less capable than the previous one. And so the senior monks are always going to be in a better position to judge our behavior than we ourselves might be. They will have a better experience, better background, better training, more accurate knowledge of how a monk should behave. Because they can remember the good old days, and the good old days really were better. The Buddha's dispensation should last for 5,000 years. So we're halfway through it. It has declined now halfway. So we have already fallen quite a great distance from the original standard. Therefore, the elder monks should be consulted and their advice should be taken very seriously. Now the next verse, this is a wonderful verse. By going forth, I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and pleasing to me. If you really follow the life of a monk, You will become detached from everything. You won't cling to anything. This means that you will give up all of the things that you currently consider pleasing and dear and beautiful and so on. For example, when I became a monk, I gave up my practice of music, which had been actually the central feature of my life up until that time. And you ask any monk, they all have something that they were very attached to that they gave up by becoming a monk. This is the sacrifice that one has to make in order to attain Nibbana. Nibbana is a very, very deep realization of reality. One has to be willing to sacrifice everything to attain it. Next, by going forth, I am the owner of my actions, comma, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related to my actions, and have my actions as my shelter. This is the realization that we create ourselves, our future selves, through our present activities. Anyone who actually studies the Buddha's teaching, especially dependent origination, will realize that what we have now, our present life and situation and circumstances, is nothing but the results of what we had done before. And similarly, our future will be nothing but the results of what we are doing now. This is a very important realization for anyone who is trying to control their senses. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, I will inherit the result. This is the view of a person who is actually trying to control the senses. Next. By going forth, what am I becoming as I pass the days and nights? This is the further realization of the same point, that by being a monk, one is in a process of becoming. What am I becoming? What is going to be the result of each and every action that I take during the days and nights as a monk? What is going to be the comma? What is going to be the dependent origination resulting from those intentions and actions? One should certainly consider this very, very deeply. Next, by going forth, do I delight in an empty dwelling? A monk 
should relish solitude. Not that he becomes attached to uh, a monastery or the company of the other monks, maybe during the period of learning. But once he becomes mature, once he becomes independent, he should go out alone, find a solitary place, and meditate until he gets the result. Uh, that's the real life of a monk. Not that one becomes a captive of fish in the aquarium of the monastery so that the parishioners can come and, and gawk at him doing some esoteric rituals or something. Uh, this is not the purpose of monk life. Monk life is to become self-realized. One should not remain a samanera forever, which is a, a novice monk who is in the monastery learning the art of self-realization. One should become mature and go out and realize. Next. By going forth, have I attained a superior state of human beingness, a truly noble perfection of knowledge and insight? The word here is manusadhamma. Manusa means man, and of course, dhamma means truth or state of consciousness, or really in this case, a state of beingness. Have you become everything that a human being can be, and especially jnana dasana? Do you have the perfection of knowledge, wisdom, insight? Are you a true Arya, an Aryan? An Aryan is a person who is dedicated to spiritual advancement. And Jnana Dasana means the perfection of realization, Arhantship. Have you attained Arhantship? Because this is the purpose of being a monk. It's not simply to collect donations or even to teach, although that's a very important part of being a monk. But the real purpose of the monk life is self-realization, enlightenment, liberation, Nibbana. And then he goes on in the next verse, So I won't feel embarrassed when my fellow renunciates question me at the end of my life. Now this refers to a custom among the disciples of the Buddha, which is narrated in at least one sutta that I know of, where at the end of a monk's life, the other monks gather around and they inquire from him, well, what has been the realization of your life? What is your state of being? Are you still clinging to this and that and the other thing? And there's quite a detailed list of questions given in the sutta that they ask him. So if one has not applied himself uh, to the pursuit of enlightenment, at the end of his life, he'll be embarrassed when his renunciant friends question him. Or even if that doesn't happen, he'll feel embarrassed by, here I have lived my whole life, maybe even the majority of my life as a monk, and I still don't have enlightenment. I still don't have complete nibbana, complete self-realization. This would be a terrible thought at the time of death. So one should certainly reflect on this and what it means in terms of present activities. The Buddha says, These are the ten truths that a person controlling his senses certainly should reflect on often. Not only monks, but also lay persons who are aspiring to nibbana. The final few lines have been interpolated. This is the customary ending of a sutta, but because the original text is drawn from a longer, much longer passage, it doesn't contain this particular thing, so that has been interpolated into the text here to, so that it makes sense. It, it appears as a complete sutta when it's chanted in the paritta. I should also say that the purpose of all these Purita chanting videos is to help you chant these uh, prayers yourself, and that you should practice along with the video, as well as study on your own, and learn these things uh, as an important part of your practice. Buddhism is not only about meditation. It's also about performance of pious activities that bring good karma. Otherwise, how will you have the kama to attain enlightenment? And as we'll see in other installments of this series, there are many prayers meant to instill a mood of service and giving and offering, which generates that kind of kama, subhakama. So, good luck. Buddha Saranai, Terawan Saranai. Mm -hmm.